The thing that uh, did actually uh, change my, my career in a big way was the fact that at some point in the, I think in the summer of 1972, I, I'm always slightly confused about the dates, but I guess it has to be the, uh, uh, the summer of 1972, I had a colleague um, at Cornell University in the US, uh, Bob Richardson, and I had corresponded with him about some work I had done on uh, the um, nuclear magnetic uh, resonance properties of um, helium-3, liquid helium-3. Um, we had quite a nice correspondence, but I never actually uh, met him. Sometime in June, I think, of 19... I get a bit confused about this. It had to be 1972. Yeah. I was on a holiday in Scotland, you know, rock climbing. I had to phone back to the University of Sussex for some reason, like some trivial administrative uh, thing. And uh, the person who answered the phone told me that um, uh, Bob Richardson was uh, going to be coming through Sussex the, in a couple of days' time, and if I was around, uh, would like to talk to me. Well, one thing which I found out later was that the reason that Bob was visiting Sussex had nothing to do with me, had nothing to do with physics, basically. It was because um, uh, his wife was a great friend of the wife of one of my uh, uh, colleagues in the physics department at Sussex, and they just wanted to get together. And that was really the main reason why Bob was visiting Sussex, but as I say, nevertheless, he liked to take the opportunity to talk to me. In order to talk to Bob, I had to go back from Scotland one day earlier than I had originally intended. Uh, and so I debated with myself, uh, do I uh, want to do this or do I want to stay and, and finish my climbing holiday in Scotland? And I think on the day, in the morning I had to make the decision, it was raining as it often does in Scotland, and that made up my mind for me. I decided to come back and talk to Bob. What Bob actually told me uh, was these amazing uh, experimental results um, he'd been getting, he and his group had been getting on uh, liquid helium-3 below about three milligrams Kelvin. And in particular, about the nuclear magnetic resonance results. Uh, this really puzzled me. I really couldn't get it out of my mind. Very luckily, um, we're talking about June, which is the beginning of the summer vacation in, uh, uh, at the University of Sussex. So I had a lot of time to think about this. And so I started thinking about these results and um, eventually came up with um, an idea about uh, what might be going on. I, uh, uh, I wrote, the, uh, wrote about these ideas to Bob, um, but, but it also happened that um, in uh, August or September of, of that year, um, there was actually a major, the major um, international low temperature uh, physics conference. That's a, a three-year, uh, three-year interval conference. It's the, the major uh, world conference on on low temperature physics. And one of my colleagues, Mike Richards, um, was um, uh, going to be attending that conference. I was not going myself, but I gave a a sort of draft manuscript to Mike, and he uh, he actually read it at the conference and. It caused quite a bit of a, a stir. A lot of people were interested in it. But needless to say, I was not the only person working on that problem. And um, in particular, Phil Anderson and Jan Ravama uh, were also looking at it, and a lot of other people. And so for the next few months, um, there was a lot of controversy. I wasn't really able to take part much in that uh, controversy because uh, I had a very heavy teaching load at Sussex. That's one thing I should mention, actually, that um, at Sussex, I was um, the teaching, by which I mean in the same room with, with, with students actively engaged with them in, in uh, lectures or small group tutorials or whatever, um, for anything between 12 and 15 hours per week, which I would think on a northern, for a, um, Northern American Research University sounds a lot. And it was quite a lot, and it, uh, it kept me pretty busy. So 
And for that next period of about eight months between the uh, early fall of 72 and the, um, the spring of 73, uh, Easter of 73, I really wasn't in a position to give much time to, uh, to research, including the Healing Three problem. But um, Bob Richardson invited me to Cornell um, for, the, for the month of April in, uh, in 73. I was able to go across, I was uh, no family responsibilities at that point. Um, I was able to spend that whole month thinking about nothing but the healing through problem and eventually came up with a theory which uh, satisfied me and uh, did seem to explain the existing experiments. And what was, uh, what was even more pleasing was that I was able to make some predictions for uh, different kinds of experiment which um, had not so far been conducted, but could be conducted. And a year or so later, um, uh, Doug uh, Osheroff, who started at that, that moment was at Cornell, but moved to, uh, to Bell Labs, he, he was able to do that experiment. And sure enough, it came out exactly according to the predictions of the theory I developed. So th I think that, that work I did on the nuclear magnetic resonance Plus, very importantly, the work which um, simultaneously uh, Phil Anderson and Bill Brickman did on the uh, relative stability of the various phases of Helium-3 uh, really um, sort of clinched it that uh, in the minds of most of the community that what was going on in these experiments was indeed the onset of Cooper pairing, which was presumed to imply superfluidity in um, in liquid helium-3, and that's basically how the, uh, how, how the, the huge topic of superfluid helium-3 um, started. Uh, so, so as I mentioned, um, I had become um, interested in uh, the foundations of quantum mechanics, but then I've been sidetracked onto, uh, onto superfluid helium-3, and I spent most of my um, time um, in the um, early and mid uh, 70s on superfluid helium-3. But nevertheless, I uh, was intrigued by the quantum measurement problem. And it occurred to me, um, I forget when exactly, the sort of, I think probably a gradual process, um, it um, occurred to me that um, the measurement prob problem only arose if you um, simply assume that the linear formalism of um, quantum mechanics could have continued to apply not just to electrons or atoms or even molecules, but to mesoscopic um, and even macroscopic objects like uh, counters and cats, as in the Schrodinger's cat um, thought experiment. It seemed to me that this is not obviously um, true. It might be true, but uh, we had no evidence for it, and therefore it would be nice to try to, to, to gather evidence that uh, quantum mechanics was still working uh, at a scale which was much more closer to the everyday level than, than that of electrons and atoms. Yeah. Uh, so I started to think about how one might um, find evidence for or against this hypothesis that quantum mechanics still worked at this level. Now, the problem is, of course, that um, for most of the phenomena we are used to in physics, or at least were used to at that point in time, it's, it's really rather difficult or even impossible to tell whether quantum mechanics is working, because a correct quantum mechanical calculation um, of, a, of the behavior of a macroscopic object will usually give exactly the same result as you would have got by thinking about it in ordinary classical terms. So we had to try to, to think about, or try, try to look for some phenomenon which, where, where um, this was not true, where quantum mechanics might, might have some chance of predicting different results um, from uh, the, the, those predicted by classical physics. And um, it, it occurred to me that one possibility uh, was the phenomenon of quantum tunneling through a classically forbidden barrier. Uh, would, is it possible that uh, certain kinds of 
what we might call, reasonably call a macroscopic system, would be able to show this phenomenon of so-called macroscopic quantum tunneling. And actually, uh, I think I made a, first made a brief mention of this in a conference proceedings in Grenoble in 1979. This was actually not an entirely new idea in the sense that people in, um, uh, in uh, particle physics like um, Sidney Coleman um, had proposed uh, phenomena like the decay of the force vacuum, which basically is, is the, the equivalent of macroscopic quantum tunneling in the condensed matter area. Um, anyway, so um, I, I started looking, um, looking around for possible systems, and uh, <coughs> by, by a, 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 I had a coincidence. Um, at that time, um, the, a new faculty member, a, a junior faculty member, um, or a research fellow rather, called Terry Clark, um, had arrived at Sussex, and he was a great expert in uh, Josephson devices, and in particular, um, what uh, are nowadays called, um, what in those days were called um, uh, RF squids, and, and nowadays they would be called flux qubits. So I, I talked to Terry quite a lot about this, and uh, Terry was also, um, incidentally, was independently very uh, uh, very keen on demonstrating quantum mechanical effects in uh, uh, in these uh, these RF squids, uh, but I, after interacting with him for a little while, I have to say I found his approach uh, rather too naive. And in particular, um, uh, it, uh, his his approach to this problem seemed to completely neglect the fact uh, that most RF squids are subject to a considerable amount of dissipation. So I started uh, trying to formulate the problem. Uh, how would the fact that uh, in any macroscopic body, like say an RF squid, uh, that, that there's a lot of dissipation, how would that affect and possibly inhibit the occurrence of, uh, of quantum tunneling in such a system? And so sometime, I think probably around the uh, mid 70s, I would vaguely sort of formulated this problem and um, it was just about at that time that Amir Caldera arrived and uh, joined my research uh, group at Sussex. And so we thought about the problem together and we batted it backwards and forwards. Um, and eventually, um, Amir um, came up with the idea that what we could do is, is to use the so-called uh, Feynman-Vernon um, formalism in which you I actually tried to um, write down a description of the system you're interested in, coupled to the environment which is giving rise to dissipation. And so rather than, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of people in those days, I should say, were looking at this problem of dissipation in quantum mechanics, and many of them had just written down some kind of phenomenological equation which didn't seem to be terribly well, you know, uh, well justified. But Feynman and Verdun, a few years earlier, had given this um, formalism in which you, um, first of all, you wrote down a, um, a description in microscopic quantum mechanical terms of not only the system itself, but also the environment, which is giving rise to the dissipation. And, um, and then you, uh, what you would do was to, uh, if, if your environment was of a sufficiently simple form as they, uh, as they uh, postulated, then you would actually integrate out the environmental degrees of freedom and get an effective description of the system in its own right, which is more firmly based on these phenomenological uh, uh, descriptions. Um, so um, Feynman and Werner had basically written this down, but then not, not uh, run with it very much. And what um, Amir suggested was that we might be able to use this, um, uh, uh, this formalism uh, for to, to calculate um, quantum tunneling in a macroscopic object like a, a uh, an RF squid, um, and uh, so, uh, so um, this was what uh, uh, what eventually he uh, wrote his thesis on, um, and that was uh, I guess submitted in the uh, probably the summer of 1980, I think. At the same time, uh, and what was what was really nice about this is that it turned out that the uh, although you didn't know the microscopic description of a realistic system like a, a, a RF squid in, in microscopic detail, 
Nevertheless, you could obtain enough information about the parameters from uh, purely classical experiments on, say, its resistance under certain conditions, that you could pin down all the parameters you needed to make an unambiguous or quantitative prediction about the effect on quantum tunneling. And so this is basically the content of Amir's thesis that, um, the, uh, that by measuring the, uh, the uh, I mean, he, he, he mostly, in the thesis, he mostly focused on the um, application of the quantum of the Feynman Vernon uh, calculation. But, um, uh, but the nice thing about it was that uh, all the parameters or, which needed to go into that calculation could be obtained by measurements in a purely classical realm. So we were able to go to the experimentalists at this point and say, look, we have a, a clear prediction. If you, if you have this a, a, a RF squid or something similar, uh, actually a current bias junction would do to know would do just as well. If you have such a junction and you can measure the um, the resistance in a classical experiment, then we can tell you what is going to be the uh, effect on the quantum tunneling. Uh, crudely speaking, it was going to be uh, the there's going to be a suppression of the tunneling rate. And the magnitude of the suppression, well, the, the, the logarithm, well, the magnitude of the logarithm of the, of the suppression factor uh, was, is going to be directly proportional to conductance of the junction, uh, of the resistance sh shunting junction. Um, so that, that was a very satisfying result, I think. Uh, we eventually published a, uh, a physical review letter. We had some difficulty, actually, with the... Um, uh, with the publication, when we uh, when we first sent it in, as usual, a physical review letter sent it out to um, two referees. <laughs> One of them came back and said, "Yeah, yeah this is fine. It's just uh, it's uh, quite appropriate for a, a letter. Go ahead and publish it." The other review was extremely negative, and made all sorts of um, um, rather, rather to our, our mind rather nitpicking objections and and so on and so forth. So we had to um, uh, to um, try to rebut that uh, uh, that referee report, which we did. But then we got back a second copy, a second report from the same uh, hostile referee, and that, <laughs> what was rather amusing was that the um, high point of this second referee report was that uh, the referee said he. He did not understand the justification for equation five. Well, equation five was a definition and it was written with a three bar equality. So we were able to dispose of that one pretty quickly. Anyway, uh, so eventually the paper did get uh, uh, published. Um, and uh, it, uh, I think, I would say, it gave rise to a, a fair amount of um, follow up work by, uh, both by us and by uh, other people. And, um, uh, and so the, the, this topic of macroscopic quantum tunneling became um, uh, really uh, quite uh, quite important during the early 80s. And, uh, and certainly what sparked that off was indeed Amir's thesis. Well, about the move itself, there wasn't a great deal to tell. I got the offer. I actually got the offer. Um, I remember when when I was in, um, in China, in fact, in uh, this must have been in the uh, spring of 82, I think. Uh, and uh, at first, I, I really didn't think I wanted to leave Sussex. I felt I was, uh, I had my roots um, planted there fairly firmly and so forth. But the um, people in the, uh, actually it was Ralph Simmons, who was the head of physics at Illinois at that point, And he was the, the major, uh, major agent who, Organised my, as it were, my my uh, my move. He said, "Look, well, if you think there's even a five percent chance you might accept, why don't you come uh, come across for a few days and bring your wife and daughter, and uh, we will show you the place and uh, you can see what you think." So I thought, well, why not? You know, um, I still thought there really was only about a five percent chance that I would want to move. So they, um, so I did come across with my wife and daughter for five days. Um, and I um, was uh, saw all the exciting things that were going on in the physics department. I, I, in retrospect, I find it rather interesting that although uh, Ralph and his colleagues, uh, including incidentally David Pines, who was also an important agent in, in my move, and John Bardini, uh, they um, 
they made quite sure that I saw everything that I thought could possibly be, might be interesting to me uh, within the physics department, but they didn't think of showing me some of these interesting things that were going on in other departments at UIUC. And when I actually arrived, eventually I found a lot of those. So anyway, they brought us across this five days and when we went uh, back, they said, well, we'd, we'd like a decision on it in six weeks. And so I, I thought I would, you know, they'd done a lot, lot um, before me. I really should take this seriously. And so I sat down and tried to make myself a list of pros and cons and so on and so forth. And eventually, I don't, I don't know if this is just, it was just um, accidental or whether it was a deep psychology on the part of Ralph and his colleagues, but eventually, uh, after going through this exercise for a few weeks, back home in Sussex, I realised that the mere act of having to, to take the possibility of a move seriously had disoriented me so much, or sort of reshaped my thinking so much, that I would almost certainly uh, want to move from Sussex to somewhere else within the next 10 years. And it seemed very unlikely I would ever get an offer as good as the one from UIUC. So basically that made up a vote for me. Um, well, my wife and daughter were also quite enthusiastic about, about going, so that was it. We went. Many things, of course, are different at um, Illinois uh, from Sussex. Um, one of the most obvious formal differences uh, is that uh, my formal teaching load at Illinois uh, is roughly one eighth, literally one eighth, of what it was at Sussex. So you'd think. I ought to get much more re research done. I'm not entirely sure that's true. I'm not entirely sure that my research productivity uh, since coming to Illinois in 1983 um, has been uh, that much greater than it was at Sussex. Uh, but at least I, ha I don't have the excuse now that uh, I, don't, I don't take too much time teaching. So I do like to, uh, well, I certainly like to sp spend adequate time on my uh, teaching activities and have always done so. But once we've done the work on um, uh, on the influence of dissipation on quantum tunneling, uh, we realised that um, there were other kinds of problems which people had been looking at in the literature by these rather um, artificial phenomenological techniques, which we could something, say something a little more definite about uh, by, uh, by using this feynman Berman technique and um, one, one of them was was this uh, was was the problem of Brownian motion it, uh, it actually rather surprises me that as far as I know at least um, not much had been done previous to our work on, on this um, but uh, we were able to um, uh, Emil was able to do a, a calculation uh, first of all of the um, the the general problem of, of, of quantum uh, Brownian motion and then secondly, on a very specific problem, which is the interference of two wave, wave packets in a uh, harmonic oscillator. And the, only, the main point of that was that this was a, 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 a problem which did illustrate rather directly the influence of, as you mentioned, of, of dissipation on quantum interference, but it was a problem which could actually be worked out to the end um, in quantitative uh, terms. I, I was actually quite surprised to find, I, I very occasionally, Look through my um, uh, citation uh, record in uh, Google Scholar or whatever, and I'm actually quite surprised to find that um, one of those two papers, I think it's the one, on, the general one on quantum Brownian motion, is actually my third most highly cited uh, paper, despite the fact again it didn't appear in a, a particularly um, high impact journal. I think it was uh, a, a, a appeared in Physica, if I recall correctly. Uh, which is, you know, it's a respectable journal, but it's not like Nature or Science or anything like that. So again, that, that shows that exactly where you publish something is not even going to be terribly important. Um, John, you know, just a, as a, an aside, uh, an illustration of that point, um, John, John Bill's um, famous paper um, on uh, uh, local hidden variable theories and uh, quantum mechanics that was published in a, a very obscure journal, which actually went out of business within a year or two. But nowadays, it must have probably 10,000 uh, citations, probably more. 
And so I think that was that was a very non-trivial piece of work that um, uh, uh, that Amir did, uh, in addition to the the work on quantum tunneling. Although it's uh, for, for for me personally, it's the work on quantum tunneling which I tend to because it will go back to more than the quantum Brownian motion. So, so in retrospect, I think my uh, my preparation, as it were, for the work which eventually was recognised by the Nobel Prize was almost 100% ideal. I um, had, in the, in the course of my, my uh, PhD or DPhil degree, I had learned quite a bit about the, the, the uh, uh, experimental properties of uh, not just helium-4, but also the light isotope helium-3. As I mentioned, in the, my early years at Sussex, one of the uh, one of the things I did was some uh, uh, um, some research on my, uh, uh, liquid helium uh, three, as such, not just mixtures of helium three and helium four. I'd uh, also uh, one one of the things I did learn very very um, uh, very thoroughly, and this I certainly owe to my advisor Dick Taha, um, was Landau Fermi liquid theory. Let me just digress for a moment and uh, go, uh, go back to my, um, my, my postgraduate uh, degree at Oxford. Well, one of the things, I mentioned that Dirk took no, no took rather little direct interest in my research uh, as such, but uh, one of the things he did encourage me to do was to um, read the Russian literature, encourage me to learn enough uh, written Russian uh, to be able to to read the current literature in physics. And that, I think, was, in retrospect, invaluable. I got to read a lot of the important Russian papers, and in particular, of course, um, there was a lot of work which stemmed, and we're talking now about the early 60s, so there was a lot of work which stemmed from Landau's development of the Fermi liquid theory in uh, 1956, 7, I think. Um, so I was very familiar not only with the experimental properties of, of liquid helium-3, but also the, with the Landau Fermi liquid theory. However, there was one thing that I had not um, studied. And this was the general theory of nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, I had not, for example, read my, my now colleague, or ex, my former, late, late colleague, Charlie Slichter's uh, book, on which is a sort of standard text on nuclear magnetic resonance, uh, still less abrogate's book. So when the new experiments of Bob Rees and his group at Cornell came up in the um, uh, in, in 1972, I was able to start thinking about them from uh, from scratch, as it were. Uh, I guess I probably made a, almost a conscious decision not to study the standard theory of nuclear magnetic resonance simply because it was clear that it didn't describe these uh, experiments. And so I started to think of scratch, I thought in terms of some rules and so forth, along rather different lines from what most people um, were, were, were uh, trying to do. So the, other, uh, um, the other precursor to the work um, on the uh, superfluid helium-3 was um, a little piece of work I'd done during my stay with um, Professor Takeo Matsubara's group in, uh, let's see, this would be 1965, um, in Kyoto, in Japan. I'd have been just looking for useful things to do, as it were, and there was a paper which had just come out, an experimental paper, on the properties of superconducting niobium. And in those days, people thought that uh, niobium might be a so-called two-band superconductor, that is a superconductor in which um, uh, two different energy bands intersect the Fermi surface energy. And um, so it occurred to me that if this was true, then one ought to be able to make some interesting uh, predictions um, about a particular collective mode corresponded, crudely speaking, to the sloshing of particles backwards and forwards between um, the two bands, accompanied with a, an oscillation of the uh, relative 
superconducting phase of the pupil pairs in those bands. This is essentially a um, generalization of an idea which um, I had read in one of Phil Anderson's papers um, at that time. I think his paper was actually on the uh, Josephson plasmon, uh, the plasmon and the Josephson uh, junction. So I uh, uh, applied it to this particular situation. Now, I wrote a couple of papers on this um, in Kyoto and sent them off to the um, Progress of Theoretical Physics, the main Japanese theoretical physics um, journal. Uh, no sooner had I sent off those papers than uh, more experiments were done on niobium, and it turned out it wasn't apparently a uh, two-band superconductor after all. So the first side looked as if this was uh, uh, this, this work was completely wasted. As, as I mentioned, I went to Cornell for the spring of of 1973 <laughs> to, uh, to try to develop a more microscopic theory. I had already got a, a sort of some argument that that was not adequate. And I wanted to, de wanted to develop a microscopic uh, theory of what was going on in the, uh, the helium-3 experiments. And lo and behold, it turned out that uh, what, ex what was necessary was precisely a generalization of that piece of work I'd done on two-band superconductors eight years previously. So, so that, that again was a very nice piece of serendipity, I think. So I think all these um, ingredients, as it were, funneled into the work, which uh, was eventually recognized by the Nobel Medic. On the uh, on this general question of teaching and outreach, yes, I think I've always regarded um, teaching as um, at least as important a, a, a part of my scientific career as, uh, as uh, research. Um, and in fact, one practice which I um, have uh, employed both, and this was both at Sussex and at uh, Illinois, is that I always try to make it a point to, to um, teach material um, which is not in my specialist area of research. And in fact, is, is perhaps as far from it as possible. Uh, so at Sussex, I think I taught every, every, every uh, course in the undergraduate um, uh, curriculum with uh, two exceptions. Um, the first exception is, is practical electronics. As I mentioned, I'm, I've never been particularly good with my hands, so I I, I never tried to get into that business. The second one is more surprising. At Sussex, and actually after coming to Illinois, um, I have never taught a straight undergraduate course on introductory quantum mechanics, despite the fact that um, much of my research, of course, has been on the foundations of quantum mechanics. I've, ta I've taught courses on the foundations, but I've never taught a, 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 a simple introductory course on quantum mechanics. However, I did make up for that um, by teaching such a course when I was in, in West Africa. I spent, uh, I haven't uh, so far mentioned this, but um, uh, there were two semesters in the mid 70s, which I actually spent at the University of Science and Technology in Ghana in West Africa. And there I taught a number of um, the um, introductory course, physics courses, including a basic course on quantum mechanics. So I have taught it, but just not at uh, Sussex or Illinois. But as I, at Sussex, I taught just about every other course in the undergraduate syllabus. Um, since moving to Illinois, I have, for example, volunteered to, call, to teach um, courses on uh, general relativity and cosmology, on Lie algebras, on, um, on uh, aerodynamic fluid and uh, hydro and aerodynamics and goodness knows what else. And the reason I do this, the reason why I, I, I do volunteer to teach these courses, which are so far from my own specialist area, is that I believe that um, if, I, if I have to, in some sense, learn them from scratch, then I'm in much better position to, uh, to, to um, sympathize with the difficulties which students find on coming to them first time. Whereas if I teach material, which is something of my own research, and I'm just going to take far too much for granted and uh, simply will not realize the sort of uh, problems that the, uh, the students are having with them.
I, I, I do believe that each outreach is very important. I am something to do a little bit about that in the, sense, in the following sense, that I have given lots and lots of outreach talks um, about, uh, for example, the foundations of quantum mechanics or the arrow of time or, or things like that, things which are certainly very interesting to a uh, popular audience. But uh, th th these are not things which are particularly close to everyday life um, societal problems. Um, I sometimes feel I perhaps should have spent more time um, giving talks, um, for example, about um, misconceptions concerning the dangers of nuclear energy and so forth. I, I, feel, I do feel rather strongly that um, the way in which people look at, um, uh, at, at the hazards um, uh, connected with nuclear energy is quite disproportionate to the way in which they regard other kinds of, uh, of hazards, such as, for example, chemical, uh, chemical toxins and, and uh, so on. Let me give you an ex example of, of that. Shortly after the um, Fukushima accident, which uh, we're, I guess no now remembering since it's 10 years ago um, in Japan, there was a headline um, which appeared in the New York Times, on the front page of the New York Times, which um, said that in some place, uh, some uh, random place in downtown Tokyo, a, an alarming level of radioactivity had been detected, and this was presumed to be due to the Fukushima accident. I, luckily, they actually gave the numbers. I looked at this, um, uh, the, the numbers and did a, a simple bag of remote calculation. I figured that if you had actually camped out on that particular piece of ground for the rest of your life, the, you'd be getting um, less uh, radioactivity, you know, less radioactive exposure than a typical um, flight attendant uh, uh, gets working between Washington and Tokyo. In other words, uh, the, the radioactive hazard had been, uh, been ridiculously blown up uh, with respect to other kinds of, of um, hazard which we appear not to worry so much about. So, so yeah, I think uh, uh, that's one of the things I think is um, where the, the general public needs to, to understand the science a great deal better than they, they seem to be mostly doing right uh, right now. But uh, you're, I think you're also right that there's also scope, and again, I, I feel perhaps a little bit guilty about not having done more about this personally, there's the scope in uh, trying to educate the, the, the public generally about what science can and, and cannot say, the kinds of degrees of certitude that we can Get, which um, incidentally, which are, are very much more more precise in the case of nuclear hazards than they are in the case of many chemical ones. The nuclear hazards are perhaps in some sense the, the most quantitatively researched kinds of hazard that one's ever likely to meet in their everyday life, but uh, this does not seem to be appreciated by the general public. In the case of specific issues like um, vaccination, um, everything that um, reasonably can be done is already being done. But uh, I don't quite see what more one could do. After all, um, it's not, not only that, uh, we re repeatedly get um, the, the top medical experts addressing us on television, but, but uh, the public figures like politicians and sports figures have gone out of their way to be vaccinated um, in front of the television cameras and so forth. And if, if that's not working, I, I, I frankly don't know what, it, what will work. So, so I think on very specific issues, really, there's not, not an awful lot where we could be doing that we're not doing. Um, but, um, in a more general case, I think what is um, what may be helpful is quite simply direct social contact. I mean, people tend to uh, I think one, one thing which a lot of people have noticed is that particularly since the development of social media uh, over the last couple of decades or so, it's very easy to live in a so-called bubble, um, that is to, uh, to get exposed only to uh, views which um, in some sense or other you already have. 
this is disastrous, I think. We certainly have to think about ways of, of getting around this. Uh, my own recipe, such as it is, would be, well, simply make as many informal contacts as you can with people who do hold views which are um, radically opposed to yours. If I had the chance, um, what I would do is to try to meet up with um, one of these um, conspiracy theory addicts or whatever and make a proposal to him or her. Namely, let us exchange media for a week. Uh, I will um, promise that for the next week, I will only watch uh, Fox News. So uh, I guess you know, you know let's see, uh, one of the extreme right wing um, television stations on condition that you will watch only CNN. Similarly with newspapers and so forth, I, I will um, uh, take, uh, I'll make sure to buy for a week the, the newspaper, which you regularly read if you do, on condition that you buy the New York Times. Um, I think it might, it's a small thing, but I think it just might uh, help. And then perhaps even more important, get in contact socially with people who do hold these view these political and uh, scientific or non-scientific views which are that radically different from your own and try to get in, in touch with them in some kind of neutral social context uh, like a sport or or eating or something of the kind you both become convinced that the other one is a human being which is not right the case necessarily right now i think that's frankly the, the best i can suggest i don't think i have any magic uh, formula to uh, to solve this problem, I mean, I do see uh, I do see the bubble problem as a very big part of the overall one. The the fact that people are exposed only to um, uh, can easily be exposed only to views which uh, to which they already subscribe. As I say, I do think it's it's vitally important to try to shake that up a bit. But well, those are the only suggestions I have really. If I I'm asked for advice by uh, students uh, who may want to go into physics as a, as a career. Here's what I tend to say very roughly. Um, first of all, whatever you do, um, try to follow your own curiosity. Um, if there's a problem which seems to you interesting and you feel you don't understand it, then be for a way at it. and. Uh, and don't be worried if people around you keep telling you, ah, oh, that's trivial, everyone understands that. If you don't understand it, just work away until you feel you do. I think a, a um, very good example of this is the fact that, um, that in, in a vacuum, objects fall with uh, the same acceleration, g, uh, no matter what they're made of, no matter their, their, their size, their, their shape, their composition, whatever. That had been known, that, that simple fact had been understood, or what had been known as a fact, um, for 300 years um, in 1900. Einstein simply asked why. And I, th I think when he asked why, um, many of his contemporaries must have just sort of shaken their heads sadly and said, well, you know, everyone knows they, they just do. It's just a fact of nature. But by thinking about that simple fact and thinking about it really hard and long, Einstein was eventually brought to the theory of general relativity, which is perhaps the most beautiful and elegant part of modern physics. Secondly, don't spend too much time looking at the existing literature on a topic you are interested in. Sometimes it actually pays not to know uh, what the existing literature says. That uh, I think was the case with my ignorance of nuclear, of the standard theory of nuclear magnetic resonance. And uh, of course you, you do need to know, you need to know some things. You need to know the basic experimental facts. You need to know uh, the, uh, if there are any, the basic theoretical concepts which have been uh, been developed in connection with them, but you don't need to read a hundred odd papers on the subject before you start thinking about it. Much better often to start thinking about it in your own terms. Of course, when you 
finally come out at the end of the day with some kind of understanding, you do need to check whether that uh, understanding is completely novel or whether it, uh, there are places in the literature where it's mentioned. But um, even, if, uh, even if someone else has done it, the odds are he or she will never have done it in exactly the same terms as you did. So you will not have wasted your time trying to um, think about it. Thirdly, don't worry if you've done a decent piece of work and uh, it seems to have led nowhere. Don't worry too much. Uh, write it up. Make sure you do. Write it up carefully and put it away in a drawer. I will bet that 15 years down the road they will come back and help you out in a totally unexpected context. Again, that's what happened with my work on the two-man superconductor. And finally, and this is really important, I think, if you're, if you're going into physics uh, in an academic concept, a context, your duties are going to uh, include, obviously, research and uh, teaching. Whatever else you do, take your teaching just as seriously, if not more so, as you do your research. This will not only be of a huge benefit to your students, but also be of huge benefit to you. I think probably more than half of the ideas I've had during my career have come about not as a result of, of a focused intended research, but as a spin-off from the, the uh, teaching that I've uh, had to do throughout my career. So as I say, whatever else, take your teaching seriously.